Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. It's your girl Britannia, and we're here to talk about Crazy Rich Asians. Um, I really love the movie Crazy Rich Asians. I think it's probably up there when it comes to one of my favorite rom coms. I really love Crazy Rich Asians. I love Made in Manhattan. Ooh. Even though Pretty Woman is kind of eh, <laughs> it's kind of a, a, a weird storyline. I, I really liked Pretty Woman when I watched it. And of course there's like other rom-coms I can think about. But those are like, I think some of the ones I, I really like from the top of my head. And I feel like there's a couple of Disney movies where it's it's kind of rom com -y, But in like maybe a, a Disney way or like a young movie. Right? Like um, a Cinderella story. I love that movie. But I don't know if it really counts as a rom-com. Because, I, I don't know, does it count? Does it count as a rom-com? I feel like for some reason it's never, it was never really considered that way. I love um, 10 Things I Hate About You. And yeah, I think those are probably like some of my um, favorite movies or rom-com movies to rewatch. So today when I talk about um, Crazy Rich Asians, it's mostly going to be a commentary on a lot of the things that's gotten right. The cinematography is great, the acting is great, the casting is great. Uh, it's diverse because we have an all Asian cast. The first time since 1993, which is crazy because even though as a black person, I've been able to see like all black movies. The only thing is like you wouldn't see those all black movies be made international movies, right? Like we've had, I don't, I think the only all black movie or almost all black movie that was made international is Black Panther that I can think of right but as a black person I've had black movies in like the not not really Hollywood but like uh, just like I guess the, the black side of filming and media right we've had black TV shows and black movies and black films but they a lot of them were just not really looked at in this kind of valuable way the way like movies like Black Panther is today and in just and just in comparison to similar movies that had similar plot lines, similar stories about family and love and romance, like there are so many movies with the casting being majority white that were just like acclaimed and loved and adored and it's known to be iconic, but the same kind of revere was not given to these all black movies. So I really do feel for Crazy Rich Asians for, of the fact that Asian people weren't being revered in Hollywood. They didn't even get their own kind of subsection in movies in America to enjoy and feel iconic and love and revere in their own community. It's, it's, it's honestly so crazy. In Singapore at the time, you know, there was such an amazing flood of Asian movies and there was, you know, we had our own channels, we had our own TV shows, there were Asian soap operas on all the time. But then I moved to America when I was 11 and then there were none. I think it's really a nice movie to talk about right now when we're talking about um, the Asian community. So and appreciating uh, the Asian community and appreciating the work that they make, appreciating their culture, appreciating the things that comes out of the Asian community with all of the issues with Asian hate right now and just the general issues that we're having with like I guess racism being so present in our faces, or at least the the effects or the negative the negativity of racism being just in our face because of social media, because of, because of BLM, because of um, the Asian movement, right? The Asian lives movement right now. It's just, it's just so much. I think that's presented to our faces, like on on social media and on in the news. It's not like it's new, right? But I just feel like we is on a constant cycle of our awareness so it can really hurt it can really hurt the mind the consciousness our feelings to constantly see the cycle of hate just being brought to the forefront even though it being brought to the forefront in a way is useful because that means we can talk about it more we can attack it more and we can really get to the root of this issue which is racism <laughs> But at the same time, it really does hurt POC to constantly have to keep talking about it sometimes, to constantly see it, and to constantly have to go through something that we always knew existed. And especially when other people are telling us, no, it's not an issue, it doesn't exist, this is not a, a race thing, and da 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 Sometimes you just want to have um, a positive conversation about our community, so I'm trying to do that with this video just a little bit um, with like the crazy rich Asian commentary. I know that me commenting on an Asian movie cannot um, or a, a, or an Asian led movie when it's in terms of actors and, or, and a director can 
like wash away the sins and the feelings of what's going on but hopefully I can just give you guys a couple of minutes of enjoyment for people who support the Asian community, who support POC struggles, who support the fight against racism and all that stuff. So yeah, let's continue on. So I just want to also put in that I'm mostly talking about the things that I like about a movie but I will say a couple of things I think the movie could have done better here and there. I don't think it's too many things a movie really could have done better because the length of the movie was already like an hour 40. Like it was it was a long, it was a pretty long uh, movie for a rom-com. So I can understand that you can't really push a rom-com to like 2 hours or 2.15 or stuff like that. So certain things I would say this would have made it better but it wouldn't be feasible or plausible for them to actually put it in to make it better because there's only so much runtime that you know can actually be used up for certain things in the movie. Ooh, the director actually had to cut out a scene that I really wish was in the movie, a scene with um, Nick and his mom that I felt was like so impactful and emotional when they just had this this bit of silence, this long silence between them as they stood apart from each other uh, because of the breakdown that his family has caused in Nixon um, and Rachel's relationship and before they can even really have a conversation about why th things are the way they are now and how that has, has affected Nick there's just this like tense silence and you can feel it, you can hear the wind, it's like pretty good it was it was a pretty good scene in my opinion but even that had to get cut up because the movie would just run on too long so again like i'm gonna critique it here and there but with a grain of salt now of course the first thing i have to give um, crazy rich asians credit for is its crazy diversity like i said before crazy rich asians has an all asian cast and when the movie was announced and the trailer was released people were comparing to the likes of black panther about it's going to be like um, this kind of um, cultural phenomenon for a lot of people, how people will have this movie to be able to like really um, come out and show out for and really express their culture and really um, attach themselves to and really feel represented by. And Crazy Rich Asians didn't just have an all Asian cast, even within um, the ethnicities and the backgrounds of the cast, like it was diverse as well. The director said he purposely wanted Asian people from all walks of life specifically um, of Chinese ethnicities. Fun fact, the only character I believe that um, was not of Chinese ethnicity was the character Oliver. He is of Filipino descent or ethnicity, so he's like the only person who was in specifically of Chinese ethnicity. So it goes far beyond just wanting having all Asian cast or just, just wanting Asian people in a movie. He wanted the roles and the characters to specifically be of Chinese ethnicity for this specific group to have um, themselves represented accurately. It's about that accurate representation of a people, not just putting um, faces on a character or faces in film and, show, and saying that these are these people, but actively representing those people and that community. So it went far beyond what it really needed to do. And when it comes to backgrounds, the director, again, he said he wanted not just people who were of Chinese ethnicity, he wanted people from all walks of life. He wanted pe Chinese people with uh, an eight with an American accent because I grew up in America. He wanted people with a Filipino accent. He wanted people with an Australian accent. He wanted people with um he wanted people with an English accent. He wanted different backgrounds and accents with Chinese slash Asian faces or representation in the movie and he did that also really well and I think that's also very interesting to show that even though people are of one race or ethnicity you know they don't have the same background we all don't walk the same path we don't all have the same lifestyle we don't all talk the same look the same act the same because even though we are of one race we are not a monolith and sometimes that seems lost as a concept beyond non-POC people um, like for example, just like a commentary that doesn't acknowledge the fact that race is not a monolith and that just because people of, un of our one race that does not mean that we all act the same. I read some comments about the movies in just like general review um, sites because I like to do that sometimes about a movie. When I make these comment when I make these um, videos, I want to try to see how many different perspectives. Pers uh, 
I want to try to see how many different perspectives I can add to my own um, commentary and my own review. And like I said before, I think another video I like to um, counter argue or agree depending on what was said. And this is something I really want to argue against is that people were complaining about, oh, why do you need an all Asian cast? If you want to see all Asians in the movie, you can watch a movie produced by an Asian country or just generally from Asia. So you could watch maybe um, a Korean drama, you could watch a Japanese movie, or you could watch a movie made um, by a Chinese production studio or something like that. And the issue with those very, very ignorant comments are is that just because I am of Chinese ethnicity or if because I'm Asian, uh, yeah, I can enjoy and watch a movie that comes out of Asia or made by, you know, an Asian studio or whatever it be, you know. However, it doesn't mean that I will truly feel represented. As for a specific example, if I am Asian American or I'm um, a um, British Asian or Asian Brit. I'm not sure how they say it um, or if I'm an Asian Australian I won't truly feel represented because that movie wasn't specifically made for me or my background for example I am black obviously <laughs> but I come from the Caribbean now I don't think I've ever actually seen a black uh, or a Caribbean movie I don't really know any Caribbean movies I didn't really grow up growing up in my country we didn't really have the only Caribbean channel we had was Tempo and that's like Caribbean BET right so I didn't have any Caribbean movies just like showing on TV what's mostly American TV um, I'm, I'm mostly American channels and American um, viewing so I watched a lot of African American TV shows and like they really um, stick with me throughout my childhood like they're, they're I really have them to this day in my heart I will still be watch like stuff like Friday with my boyfriend I make him watch like all of my favorite um, African-American movies or African-American casted and directed movies but however that does not reflect my personal experience I've never seen in those movie like the family waking up and cooking plantain you know I've never seen them eat stew peas and rice I never see them have pigtail for dinner I will and I would never really see that in an african-american movie because that's not their culture so I can't really and truly feel represented by their movies I can feel somewhat represented by that black experience which is a more general experience but specifically my cultural experience will not be reflected by an african-american movie the same way I can watch like um, Beyonce versus Rihanna if you know that African movie <laughs> or I'm not sure if it's like Nigerian or whichever it probably is a Nigerian movie because I know they have Nollywood but if you ever watch Beyonce versus Rihanna which is like an African movie I love <laughs> I love that that was a thing as well that I had like um, when we ran out of movies to watch we'd go to like the DVD store the DVD store or that store that sells CDs anyway um, and they would have like a bunch of African movies and I watched Rihanna <laughs> versus Beyonce that was a movie that is a movie that is a movie it's pretty great but that doesn't reflect too much for me because even though we're the same race again we don't have the same um, cultural experiences plus that movie wasn't really a realistic movie anyway it was just like taking the pee taking the piss out of like a lot of things so it was more like a, a, a funny drama I'd have to say so that's why the diversity in Crazy Rich Asians matters and not only matters is done well and is really impactful but um, one thing I'd have to add when it comes to the diversity that just like a nitpick I think that could have like furthered the diversification not in a race way well someone I guess is there's a scene where the aunties are like um, grouped together doing basically like Bible study, reading Bible verses, which is a common thing that older ladies, um, I guess older Christian ladies would do from now and again. And usually the, the Bible study thing sometimes is just like a covert um, cover up for let's gather and gossip and drink tea and uh, or whatever it is, right? And like that's not um, something that's just done with like Christian ladies like I watched this scene I think in Devious Maids where the girls gathered for a book study and book study is just a cover up for gossip and wine in the middle of the day da 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 da. However I feel like with this instead of having the aunties or specifically 
the Chinese Singaporeans be Christian. I think it would have been interesting to see them be maybe another religion that's predominant in Asia or in Singapore specifically. Of course, there are Christian people that live in Asia and different Asian countries. However, we, I feel like we always see Christianity as religion represented in film and media, especially when you want to represent them as like that daunting family that you have to impress that they have these Christian values and sometimes that's hard on the interloper. However, I feel like one way that we could have seen like the foil against an Asian American um, upbringing or someone being of Asian ethnicity and also being raised and brought up in Asia is that, you know, you may have a um, religion or cultural background that represents the, the motherland uh, more closely. Like, you could have had um, Rachel and her mom be Christian, which is a big religion in the USA, and have um and have Nick and his family and his close friends be of another religion you know I feel like it would have been a great uh, opportunity to create foil as well as further diversification because every religion represented in media and film does not have to be Christianity I'm pretty sure everyone knows about Christianity it's very widespread throughout the world because of you know, uh, <laughs> you know, those things that they did in the past to spread the word. So it would have been a great opportunity to showcase some of the small religions that are really not known to a lot of people that exist in uh, Asia or Asian countries. That's my only like, I think that's my only nitpick when it comes to diversity. Now the other thing I really liked about this movie was the music. I thought the music tracing in this movie was phenomenal. I think a soundtrack can really do justice for a movie. A good soundtrack can really make your movie very memorable because you have that particular song that just like gets stuck in your head sometimes and you really like connect it with a movie and then you may even just watch that movie just to listen to the song over again in that context of the scene which it first appeared in for you. Like um this is a great example of um, just like one song in a movie that kind of made you love the song and the movie and makes you kind of want to rewatch it. The song in Jennifer's Body, the one that's literally made for the movie Jennifer's Body, the one that's sung by the band, it's an in-movie song, the one sung by the band, um, Low Shoulder. I can't remember the name of the song, but like when that song plays in the movie, I love it. I literally sing it as if it's a, as if this is a real song. I know all the lyrics to and I would sing in my room and play and I scream it out when the, the scene plays whenever the song comes on and that's what a great like soundtrack does like uh, another good example in general uh, is like the Shrek movies they always had a great soundtrack and there are people who know some of the songs I don't know they are actual songs and will watch Shrek to hear the songs like I am a hero people would rather go watch Sh the Shrek scene of it singing than the actual YouTube video of that song. So I think a great soundtrack can make a movie way more memorable than it actually even is. It adds it adds something to the movie. It adds feeling, it adds love, it adds care for, um, for the audience to the movie. So I love the soundtrack in this movie. One of my top two favorite songs is, and I hope I'm saying the first one correctly, is Wo Yao Ni Di Ai. Again, I hope I said that properly. Um, originally sung by Grace Chen. But in the movie, I think that's more of a jazz kind of rendition of the song. Um, so it's like a really poppy jazz song. And I think they really push it there with the jazz in the movie with um, the live band in the, in the movie. And the second is Material Girls sung in Cantonese. I really like that. And I'm not a fan of really Madonna or Madonna's music. But something about Material Girls in Cantonese, it, it did something for me. I like the ability to be able to recognize a song by like maybe the rhythm of the instrumental, but it being kind of um, made different to match the movie or the, the film or media, like how Bridget and Dunn with like all of the pop songs. And you're kind of like, huh. Like this is a pretty, pretty nice um, what, 1700s English song and you're like, hold on, <laughs> wait a second, this is not Beethoven, <laughs> like that's Ariana Grande, but they mask it to match the toning and the era of that show and the same thing they did here with um, Material Girl, they turned it into, can they used the Cantonese version of the song or translated into Cantonese in order for us to kind of stick to the Asian toning of the music of the movie or the Chinese toning of the movie. 
but still give people something that they can recognize. Another great thing about those two songs is that they have like a great interpretation when you really look at the context of which they are being played through in the movie at, at certain scenes. First of all, with um, the song um, Woya Ni Yai, it's, if you watch the original video for that song, it's actually showing that there is this woman and she's kind of chasing this guy and she's telling him how she wants him. I want you. I, I, I want you close to me. I want you. And I think if you really look at this song, this music video and the movie and you give an analysis, or at least this is my analysis, is that it greatly represents what's happening in the movie or what's happening in Nick's and Rachel's relationship. So it seems like throughout a lot of the movie, Rachel is putting in a huge amount of effort into maintaining their relationship, trying to win over the favor of Nick's family, trying to maintain the status quo between them and keep everything afloat. Meanwhile, she's suffering. And Nick is not particularly doing too much to intervene in, into Rachel's suffering or to mediate the issues that she's having with his family, specifically with his mom and her and his ama later down the road. So it feels like Rachel is putting in all this effort and she is basically chasing Nick. She's chasing Nick. She's chasing this relationship. She's the only person that really seems like they're giving it their all and they're, and they're giving it um, all of their care. But if you didn't really know any background about, about that, that song or the music video you really you wouldn't really tune into that information I think it's also particularly perfect that that song plays like a few times and one of the most significant times it plays and I loved it the most is at um, the wedding reception at a certain point Rachel is at her boiling point with trying to do all this stuff and trying to appease everybody around her and everybody in Nick's life and at the end of the day she is the one who's running away so it kind of subverts it right at some point she's chasing and now she's running away to be chased later down so I think with that song it captures that beautifully like kudos to the person who made that choice probably the director so kudos to you and second the second song the Cantonese material girl and this song has like a double entendre to it of course the most obvious and blatant interpretation of the song is that everybody is very materialistic it's the song we hear playing when Rachel is choosing her outfits her dress she's going through different looks in order to go to the wedding and and then we're also having this kind of red carpet scene when all of the other guests are arriving and they're taking their pictures so we're seeing a lot of glamour and clothing and style and fashion we're also going to go to this wedding that we already know is very expensive so it's, it's a lot about status and we're, sh we're getting shown that and we're seeing that right in this scene and now the second um, double entendre the meaning is that you know the Cantonese translation of material girl kind of implicates that uh, you know there's this couple and they're so hot and heavy and they have so much tension for each other that you know just with a, a hug you know <laughs> they get each other bothered so it can also allude to the fact that that Nick and Rachel are a new love or even maybe this couple that's getting married they're in, they're a new love it's alluding to the fact that there's new love involved in this movie and that they love each other and they're so involved in each other and the love is just so hot and piping that you know they they're getting each other bothered I guess since we're speaking about um, the scene the fashion basically or the, the runway or the red carpet scene before the wedding leading up to the church um, since we're talking about that let's talk about the fashion because we saw you know a lot of people walking up with their dresses and da, da 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 in that scene so let's talk about my one biggest gripe about the movie was the cinematography or the the direction when it came to showing the fashionable pieces and outfits this has to be my biggest complaint and my I think for me like one of the biggest letdowns about the movie is that a lot of the times it seemed it seemed like a lot of people had on really expensive or really beautiful or gorgeous outfits and pieces and I don't just mean like the main cast I don't just mean like Rachel because I think we, we really got a good look for everything that she had on but a lot of the times you had side characters for example um, Nick's ex I can't remember her name at the red carpet before the church I saw like the top straps like the top the top half right of her dress and from what I could see about her ruched delicate dress with it it seemed like it had like a, a nice deep V it seems and it was like a printed pattern as well it seemed like it was a beautiful dress I can only assume that it would be a maxi because that's what it looks like it, sh it probably was gonna be but I don't know 
because I didn't see the whole dress. And I had that issue a lot of times throughout the movie. They paid, the movie, the cinematography paid a lot of attention when it came to wide, clear, angled shots that, that uh, got the whole look in with the main characters, um, Rachel, and a lot of times with Astrid, and sometimes with Nick. Um, and when a, a certain uh, outfit was really important, like the wedding dress at the end. However, there are a lot of times when the side characters are not just wearing outfits that are... Like, I was praying for a wide shot angle. Sometimes, even when it was about the main characters, we didn't get a really good wide shot. One, sh one scene that really annoyed me that I was able to see the outfits, but it would have been the perfect wide shot scene at that time is when um, Nick, Rachel, Nick's mom, and um, um, Nick's ama are in the same scene after the wedding. It's like at the wedding reception and like when Nick's ama and um, Nick's mom is kind of confronting Rachel with this information, false information that they had about Rachel. It's a really important fashion scene because they're all kind of wearing the same, um, they're all wearing the same color but to different effects to kind of show um, different things and different meanings and we're gonna get to that later on when it comes to like purposeful costume designing but I saw and yeah I saw what they had on but I didn't have a great picture moment of it because I didn't get a wide angled scene I had a close headshot and it did not help so that was a big pet peeve for me when it came to this movie and I think it's the only thing about this movie that really makes me feel a bit disappointed because everything about this movie is kind of superior. We're talking about um, purposeful costume designing. I do think throughout the movie, uh, I do think throughout the movie a lot of the costume designing was pretty good and you, there are moments where you could definitely see that this was, uh, or the characters were dressed this way intentionally and it gave off a vibe that you understood and was well reflected. However, there are also some times where it fell flat. So I'll just start off with the times where the movie was fine, costume design was. Um, one of the times where it was like perfectly fine, costume design was, is like you can tell in general in the movie when you start off, and this is something that was intentional, and the costume designer herself said that this was intentional, is that in the beginning of the movie, they have more kind of like drabby, um, dull clothing colors in the beginning of the movie. And when we get to Singapore, after we leave the US and we get to Singapore, the clothes get really brighter, everything gets brighter, the scenery, the landscape, everything's bright, so the clothes kind of match that atmosphere, that fun, that, 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 that boastfulness, right? So that was one thing that was done intentionally and it was done beautifully. Another thing is like pulling Eleanor, Nick's mom, into this jade green silk blouse. Um, in in a scene where Eleanor goes to confront Rachel at the top of the staircase in her in her in the grandma's home, so the costume designer had always planned on Eleanor wearing jade. The original sketch I think was just like her more in of a, a a jade skirt in I think in a black top. And in this scene we have Eleanor in a jade silk top like I mentioned before, and like these white linen seams or just like these soft um, white flowy trousers. And honestly, I really wish that they would have just leaned in and made her a bit more domineering. The look is very classy and almost soft a bit. I wish they would have made her just a bit more domineering, maybe even lean in and go fully jade. Have the hair and the head to toe jade outfit. I don't see why we couldn't do it. Maybe add a bit of black or a bit of something else, a bit of a neutral color in maybe a cardigan or a blazer or a jacket of some sort. But I would have leaned in more with the jade and I think it would have been, I think it would have made a, a, a bit of a difference. Maybe not that significant of a difference, but a bit of a difference. In another scene where I think just a small bit of tweaking could have made uh, more of an interesting point and added to the story with costume designing is where Rachel spills her wine on Nick's, suit, on Nick's outfit, Nick's suit. I think at the time he's wearing like a white suit and the ins and an inside dress of whatever color, it doesn't matter, right? And he goes up to his room to change. And his mom is there, Eleanor is there, and she hands him um, a blouse to change the inside of the blouse that he had on previously that Rachel spilled a drink on. In that scene, we can see that Eleanor is wearing um, this kind of burgundy deep red wine. It would have made a, a better impact and it would have been way more significant if the blouse that Eleanor handed Nick was the same color as her top, the, the red wine, the burgundy, right? 
because that could have meant a couple of things, right? That could have interpreted to us that, all right, Eleanor wants to add her touch onto Nick. She wants them to match. She has this chance, this opportunity to have Nick in a way closer to her versus Rachel, right? It would even be better is if Nick originally had on something that matched Rachel's dress a bit more and then Eleanor sweeps in with the with the new blouse that matches her. You know, we see how couples like to match colors and outfits and coordinate, but if Eleanor came in and kind of undid that with something that symbolized that, no, he's unified with me or the family at least and not with Rachel, it would have been more significant. Um, in another scene where again I feel like they just they just missed the mark right there like it could have been done but it was not done <laughs> is in the scene where they're playing mahjong when Eleanor and Rachel are playing mahjong we see Eleanor walk up and which is a very nice outfit this white um, the black pinstripe suit and Rachel is wearing another I think white um, floral dress and we've seen Rachel in a lot of floral white and blue throughout the entire movie since she's been in Singapore but I thought like this was the moment to really give a, 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 two six, a, <laughs> a 260 and I think this would have been the right moment to really give a 180 and change Rachel's palette or color palette and aesthetic just completely to make a point so the Mahjong cards are green and white. Both Rachel and Eleanor are wearing white when they go to kind of to kind of put their cards down on the table and express their differences or disagreements with each other. And Rachel is gonna give her like final statement on the matter and resolve it for her in her mind the situation that's going on, right? And I think it would have been really significant if we had Rachel be in emerald, that same emerald dray green that we saw in the scene where um, Eleanor is trying to demean, is trying to be domineering over Rachel, is trying to overshadow Rachel, is trying to really just um, intimidate Rachel when they were in the jade room or staircase area. If Rachel had on uh, that, that emerald green, or even if we just put Eleanor back in that color, right? Because we, in that scene, see that the tables have turned. It's no longer Eleanor who has dominion, her dominion over everyone. She is not, we see that she is not in control, actually. She's not the one who should be who should be intimidating. She should be intimidated. So I feel like Rachel, putting Rachel in that green, when we see that there is a difference, there's a switch in power play here. And I understand that the, the Mahjong game and Rachel's like winning card and her choosing to lose the game shows that anyway. But if you also support and carry that through costume designing, it just makes it more impactful and it sends like a better and greater message. So I think they missed the point with that. Another thing I think they kind of missed the ball with, they could have done again, is when Rachel is leaving, why did we not put her back in her red dress? I think that would have been fun, that would have been cool, that would have, been, that would have had feeling behind it. When we see that she's coming, she has her red dress that she never got a chance to wear, that she picked out with her mother, where they come from a much more humble beginning than Nick's family or Nick's friends, or even her friend Pikling, who convinced her not to wear that dress and that it's an ugly dress and red is only lucky if you're and red is only lucky if you're a damn envelope, right? We never see her wear the dress, even though it has so much sentimental value to her, because the dress she played with her mom, and it was advice given to her mom, right? I think it would have shown if Rachel went home or try to go home, you know, go on the airport in her red dress with her mom, it showed that she's no longer trying to impress anybody. She's now dressing the way she intended to dress in the first place. She's being the person who she originally was. She's not faking anything. She's not performing for anybody. She's leaving in her red freaking dress. And I don't understand why we didn't wear the red dress going home. That's my final thought on everything when it comes to Crazy Rich Asians. Please watch the movie if you haven't watched it. I've watched that movie like five times. It's a great movie. It's a great cast. It's great cinematography. It's great fashion. It's great costuming. It's awesome music. There's so many good things to love about Crazy Rich Asians. The only thing that will make it any better is when number two comes out. So I hope you like this video and thank you guys for watching. Here we go. It's all about you. It's all about me. It's all about what we do. Make
can argue me Trying to find something to believe Because I'm running wild